Hello and welcome to this PCR webinar entitled PFO Closure in 2019, Who, Why and How. My name is Patrick Calvert. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Cambridge in the United Kingdom. I'm delighted to be joined today in the PCR studio by Philip Lertz from Leipzig and Carmelo Grasso from Catania in Italy. Welcome, both of you. Hello. Thank you. Philip, I'd like to start with a question that lots of people are thinking about. PFO closure itself as a procedure has been around for a long time, perhaps 20 or more years. Where are we in 2019 from an evidence point of view? Well, we now have the data of several randomized controlled trials and um, some meta-analysis as well. So I'd say that um, today the evidence is better than ever, but there is still enough um, controversy and also uncertainties to, to, to have a lively discussion about it. So we're doing okay, but a bit of a way to go yet for the sign of things. Comello, why should we be considering a PFO closure program at this minute in time? Well, Patrick, you know that uh, the, the PFO intervention is uh, probably the most easiest structural heart intervention, but we, uh, we have to be aware to select the right patient and uh, to avoid complications because we are not going to treat any pathologist, but we are going to prevent uh, further uh, and um, uh, future events. So it is really important to have the program. So that's a really important point to emphasise the importance of it being complication-free. That's a really, and we'll be coming back to that point. So the learning objective for today's webinar are how to set up a safe and effective PFO closure programme, how to select which patients might benefit from PFO closure, and that's really cru crucial to getting this programme right. And then we will go through the steps of implantation for optimal patient outcomes. So Patrick, uh, sorry, Philip, could you remind us what a PFO is? Yes, a PFO, um, which is patent for arm and ovale, is um, normal fetal communication between the right and left atrium, and that um, normally closes down by fusion of um, two overlaying septal um, tissue layers, um, and this is also illustrated on, on this slide. So on, on the top left, you see a cross-sectional view of um, a PFO so in a case where the fusion is incomplete, meaning that um, a communication is, is leaving behind. And um, you see on the right-hand side, you see the or fast view of that looking from the right atrium towards the fossa. And then the arrow shows you the direction of the um, PFO. Corresponding to that on the lower left, a, th um, a 3D TOE view of that. And again, we, look, we sit here in the right atrium looking towards the, the PFO on the top, the SVC, on the bottom, the IVC, and then the arrow pointing towards the direction of the PFO. And then on the right, you see that the same view now um, from the left atrial side with, these, um, with that opening um, very close to the aorta. So as it were, we have a clot's eye view of this. We can see it coming in through the right atrium and coming out through the left atrial openings. That's great. Okay. Exactly. Um, and I'd really be interested to hear how this differs from an atrial septal defect. Fundamentally, they are completely different. So it's important to differentiate between these two. In, in an ASD, there is failure of overlap of um, septal tissue. So there is actually tissue missing, creating a proper hole. Normally, that hole causes continuous left to right shunting. And the clinical problem with the, between um, an ASD and PFO is very much different. An ASD, and this is summarized here on that slide, an ASD causes, because of that continuous left to right shunting, it causes right heart volume overload, which eventually can then cause a right heart failure. Um, as opposed to that, a PFO, the, the shunting is normally not a problem at all, but um, under cer certain circumstances, there is the possibility of a transient um, right to left shunt, so change in, in shunting direction. And although rare, but um, it can happen because of the transient right to left shunting, um, the probability of a um, paradoxical right. emboli, and this is what we are talking about. So if I may summarize, they're anatomically quite different things and actually shouldn't be confused, they're quite different. And indeed, they can have quite different clinical presentations. Absolutely. Carmelo, so, you know, this is a common occurrence, a PFO. Um, I'm not even sure we should be calling it a pathology, really. 25% of the general population have it. Why, why does it matter? 
Well, the PFO is usually uh, armless, and uh, many people will never know to have a PFO in, uh, in uh, her home arts. Uh, but in some condition, the the sudden uh, the, the, the intrathoracic uh, pressure sudden rise, and if the right artery pressure goes uh, goes up, it can widely open and cause an embolism, a, a right to left shunt of the, of the blood. And as you can see in this uh, slide during a, a TTE bubble test, we see that during the Valsava maneuver or during uh, uh, straining or sneezing, all the conditions that cause an intrathoracic uh, uh, pressure, the right atrium became small, smaller and smaller, and then on release of, uh, during the Valsalva, all the bubbles go through the left, uh, through the septum from the right to the left, and may cause uh, embolism. And the, the first, uh, the first uh, point where they go, it is uh, uh, towards the carotid artery and then in the brain, and they may cause stroke or TIA. <clears throat> And uh, as you can see in this, this is a very, uh, I would say, very dramatic, very extreme case of a young lady with a deep uh, venous uh, thrombosis, and uh, she had an embolization, and fortunately, the thrombus was so big that remain stuck it into the, uh, into the PFL. But of course, if you have a, a smaller thrombus, they can go toward the PFOs and causes uh, embolic, uh, uh, embolic stroke. So, Philip, I mean, this, this all sounds pretty scary. Huge clots landing in the heart. I mean, <coughs> do we need to be concerned? And which PFOs are the dangerous ones and, and, and which ones need closing? Yeah, I said that example is extreme. This is really extreme. The vast majority of patients do not need a PFO closure. And PFO closure is, I think this is important to stretch, this is not for primary prevention. So we think about PFO closure only in those who um, had already a stroke, so had a history of, of some neurological events. Um, and then it is important to, to have some indication of how likely it is that the PFO was um, the cause for that um, um, stroke. And um, Briefly, that is more likely in younger patients with low cardiovascular risk and with some specific PFO features. I mean, th th thank you for that lovely little summary there. We're going to come back again and again to talk about the patient selection, a really key uh, principle to this. But if I could take a moment to summarise our discussions for the first part of this webinar. PFOs are very common and really harmless for most people. I think it's important to remember that. PFO closure does reduce recurrent stroke risk, but in young patients and patients with PFO-related strokes, patients who've been carefully selected with features that put them at increased risk. And really, patient, collection, patient selection is key to getting this right. We have one question from, our, uh, 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 from the webinar, which has just flashed up, and I, I will maybe put this to you, Carmelo, if you don't mind. So, We've talked a little bit about PFO-related uh, stroke as an indication for closure. The question is asking, what about evidence for PFO closure in migraines? What are your thoughts on this, Carmelo? Well, the evidence is that uh, uh, there is no indication of closure uh, PFO for migraines. We used to close in the past, during the past, a lot of, uh, a lot of PFOs. We do hundreds of intervention and then migraine uh, doesn't improve. So uh, now we have two... Uh, um, uh, two large studies that demonstrate that there is no improvement of migraine. I mean, that's really nice to put. I don't know, Philip, if you've got anything more to add on that? No, I, I totally agree. I mean, anecdotally, and also sometimes in, in our previous um, experience, it appears that in some patients it's really helpful and yeah. there's relief of, of symptoms due to migraine, but we don't have the evidence that the studies were, were mainly negative, and I think we have to stick to that. Totally agree. There's evidence to suggest in patients who are having it closed for PFO-related stroke that migraines also improve, but as a primary indication by itself, the RCTs do not stack up and therefore we do not uh, routinely do it close PFO yeah. for that indication. Okay, so let's talk about patient selection. Carmelo, tell me a bit about what kind of patients may benefit from PFO closure. Well, there are several conditions that uh, uh, which you may consider to close the uh, the PFOs, but since the evidence is just for uh, um, cryptogenic stroke, that means that you have a stroke without without any other causes. So you have to have 
neurologic symptoms, uh, positive brain imaging, in absence of other uh, causes of strokes that may be uh, atrial fibrillation, for example, or uh, even uh, significant carotid disease, uh, more than 50% uh, of, uh, of stenosis, on the high risk profile of, uh, so all the, uh, all the rage, uh, more than 65 years old patients, smokers, diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, hypertension, or with positive for thrombophilia. Uh, so in this case, if you exclude all the other cases, you have not to talk more, no more. You have to talk no more about cryptogenic stroke, but you have to talk about PFO-related stroke because you found the, the, the causes now. Yeah, so let's clear that little one up because we've been calling it cryptogenic stroke for quite a long time. Yeah. So if I've got it right, cryptogenic stroke is a stroke that you don't know the cause for, and yet we're talking about closing exactly. the PFO. Yeah. So, so this consensus paper would suggest that we should drop this term cryptogenic, is that right, and call it PFO-related stroke? Yeah, you are right. Okay. So I think if we can just refer to the slide that I hope we can be see broadcast through the web at the minute, this, because these are complicated factors really to talk about here. Um, neurological symptoms with st uh, positive brain imaging consistent with an embolic stroke, I think that is important. And those were the criteria into which patients were recruited into the major RCTs. And it's really from the major RCTs that we take our criteria for closing PFO because that's where the evidence is. And you have highlighted some of these other areas. Sufficient rhythm monitoring to exclude atrial fibrillation. Um, Philip, can you perhaps expand a little bit about when you think an, an ambulatory ECG is enough or where, whether perhaps you need to have more prolonged monitoring such as an implantable loop recorder? I guess in, in young patients with, with low risk of AFib, then um, it is normally sufficient to do a halter ECG. Um, but in, in older patients with a higher risk for, for atrial fibrillation, I think it's very important to, to look hard for it. Um, obviously, atrial fibrillation is, is a much more common cause of stroke. So you really have to make sure to, to rule that out. And in our practice, we, in patients who are older than 65, with some other indication that AFib is likely like, 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 uh, like um, left atrial enlargement or heart failure or any other structural abnormalities, we, we certainly would consider implantation of, an, um, of a loop recorder. Brilliant. I think that's a very nice summary. We've got a couple of questions coming through in the webinar and we'll see if we can address some of those. So the first question is, any specific tools to evaluate or measure the individual relationship between stroke and PFO? That's a bit of a tricky one there. Do you want to just see, uh, Philip, do you want to address that one? So I, mean, I suppose it's... Again, that, that um, pretty much comes down to two things. Um, these are the, the, the patient characteristics and the, the morphology, the PFO characteristics. And the PF PFO characteristics, that is a little bit easier, but there the evidence is not as robust, but it seems like um, larger PFOs with bigger shunting and um, septal aneurysms, and these are m morphologies um, which make a PFO-related stroke more likely. And then the patient characteristics, um, yeah, as I said before, that's a mixture between age, um, cardiovascular risk, and then the appearance uh, on imaging. Um, if you, you could use the ROPE score that yep. combines all of these factors. It's a score from zero to 10, and with higher scores, meaning that the likelihood that the PFO is, um, that the stroke is PFO related is higher. The cutoff value is here six. Um, but you could also do without the stroke. I mean, it, it comes down to the factors age, cardiovascular risk, and um, imaging. Okay, so if I may summarize, the ROPE score or, or indeed other clinical risk factors, you're really looking for the least risk factors for conventional stroke to make it likely to be related to the PFO. Have I understood that correctly? Correct. Yeah. Perfect, okay, fine. We have one more webinar question which we'll try and address before we move on. Does the size of PFO determine the indications for closure, or is it presence of an interatrial aneurysm necessary to consider percutaneous closure? So I suppose what we're asking for here, is the aneurysm in itself an independent risk factor, or do you think it's simply a marker of a larger PFO? I have a view on this. I wonder what yours is, Carmelo. Well, uh, <clears throat> even in the consensus document, European consensus document, uh, uh, the aneurysm um, uh, the aneurysm of the, 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 the septum, uh, together with the large uh, defect, the large shank, is associated with uh, 
uh, high probability of, uh, of stroke. So uh, I would say there is much more evidence to close this kind of, uh, of uh, PFOs. My, my, my view, Carmelo, I think, but I ca it's only a view, is that you're more likely to have a large PFO with an aneurysm. I don't believe the aneurysm in itself is an independent risk factor, but I, I could be wrong in that. I think the data is not strong enough for us to know the answer for sure. If I may wrap up on this section, when we're talking uh, about what kind of patients might benefit, you really have to ask yourself three things. First of all, is this an embolic stroke? Have you excluded other causes? And is there a PFO? What I think I'd like to do now is take us through one or two cases. So let's start with this case, if we, if we shall. We have a 54-year-old uh, gentleman who suffered from transient dysarthria and uh, dysarthria of the hand or clumsiness, a past history of hypertension, which despite being on Valsartan was not particularly well controlled with a blood pressure of 165 over 82, an elevated BMI with a normal cholesterol, an ECG showing normal sinus rhythm, and a 72-hour Holter monitor, which shows no arrhythmia detected. Transthoracic echo shows normal biventricular systolic function with some degree of diastolic dysfunction. And there's a suggestion of a PFO, which is indeed confirmed on the transesophageal echo. This is a brain scan. It shows a small lacunar infarct in the right basal ganglion. So, Philip, PFO closure, yes or no? Feel free to expand. <laughs> Well, again, if, if you go through these um, anatomical characteristics and, and patient um, specifics, um, the, the PFO description from there I would take that it's, it's possible that the stroke was PFO related. We do have a PFO. We have a mobile and aneurysmal um, interatrial septum. So there I would say yes. Um, patient specific risk, the age, um, 53, that's within the range of, of patients included in, in, in randomized trials. Um, there's a bit of cardiovascular risk profile, not, not tremendous. Um, again, this is in favor of PFO closure. We have uncontrolled hypertension. That again makes other reasons um, more, more likely. And then the imaging part is really interesting because we, we normally we assume that embolic strokes are more likely when we have um, when we see something in, in cortical um, lesions, but not so much um, lacuna. Um, however, having said that, interestingly, the, the just recently um, published um, consensus paper, there the, the, the role of imaging was, was tuned down a little bit, um, stating that it, it can help, but you should not rule out PFO closure just because it's a, of, it's a lacunar infarction. So in summary, I would guess it's a, it's a maybe. It's a situation where you certainly should involve your neurologist and have a have a good discussion with the patient. Carmela, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the same as, uh, as Philip. This is, uh, uh, this is a patient where I, I will talk uh, uh, together with the neurologist. I wanted to be sure that this is an embolic stroke and not just a lacunar infarct due to hypertension. Because we, we have seen that despite uh, medical therapy, the patient has 165 uh, systolic uh, blood pressure. So maybe it is not so well controlled. Uh, so the likelihood to, to be an embolic, uh, um, an embolic uh, stroke, it's, uh, it's less than a lacrimal infarct due to hypertension. So uh, the, the interaction with the neurologist is very important in this kind of, uh, of patient. Really crucial, I think. And I'll come, we have got the webinar questions coming f thick and fast now. So I want to give my view on this and then we'll take a couple of questions. So we've talked here about a balance, haven't we? We've got to make a judgment. Is this lacuna stroke likely to be one of those lacuna strokes that's not due to an embolic event? Given the age and risk profile, that definitely would have been the traditional view. And really on the face of it, this would not have been a patient we'd be traditionally closing. It's an older patient with hypertension and potentially other causes for a lacuna stroke. I think the consensus document makes us think a little bit more about it, and maybe if you see a lacuna stroke in a younger patient with an absent risk factor, maybe we would be more inclined to close these days than we might have been in the past. But I think the key here is to take an opinion from your neurology here, and, and their input is crucial in this as well. Yeah. So I think we've carefully chosen this to be a, a, one of those ones. It's not absolutely clear, and there needs to be an MDT discussion with your neurology colleagues. 
if I may, I will ask uh, a couple of webinar questions to you. First one, what will the strategy be if you find both an AF and PFO in a young patient? Well, I'll answer this one because I think it's a quick answer. If the AF has been found in a young patient who's had a stroke, then they need formal anticoagulation and I would not close a PFO. Any disagreement? Uh, no. I, no, I can add if, uh, if it is a uh, natal fibrillation in young patient, of course you have to try to do ablation for a, uh, for example, just to, to interrupt a okay. fib. Philip, second question. Is the evaluation of DVT mandatory when we suspect paradoxical embolism? You can be brief on this one if you wish. I mean, it's very rarely you find a DVT. Um, you would guess that when you do so, then um, it, it helps you, and um, PFO-related stroke is more likely. Um, we, per we look for those, but... Um, just because we don't find it doesn't mean that it wasn't there. Of course. So if you find it, it strengthens your, supports your argument, but the absence of one doesn't, doesn't rule out PFO closure, certainly not for me, because of course the clot has gone somewhere, right? Um, the final webinar question at the minute, what is your opinion on PFO closure in patients with embolic acute myocardial infarction? Patients with distal coronary embolization, no atherosclerosis and large PFO. Carmelo. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, that's a rare, <laughs> rare condition, but uh, it may happen. If you have a large PFO, you can have even a massive uh, uh, embolization. And if you are unlucky, the, the emboli can go uh, direct to the coronary artery or into the, uh, into the, into the peripheral vessel, just uh, skipping the, 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 the brain, the carotid artery. Yeah. It's very rare, but uh, it may happen. The way I treat these ones is uh, it's rare. Um, I want a very high burden of evidence. There's not something else going on here. So these patients, we risk assess them from a risk profile very much like we do the stroke patients because let's be clear, there's no trial data to support closure in this yeah. setting. We're borrowing it from the stroke data, so we should be just as rigorous with the stroke data. Personally, we tend to do cardiac MRIs come to these patients. I want to be very clear that this is a infarction, not some other condition such as myocarditis. And generally, you want to see a fairly substantial troponin rise as well. Um, and it's nice to have an angiographic pattern consistent with the body conclusion, although though it's not always there. So I think the key is you must think carefully about it. And then if you choose to offer closure to your patient, you need to be very clear about the lack of clear evidence and whether or not it's going to do them benefit or not. Yeah. And I guess it's a scenario where you really would like to see a, a proper PFO with wide opening and not sure. just a tiny, a tiny hole. Absolutely. Let's move on to the second case, shall we? So we now have a 38-year-old male presented with right-sided weakness after straining. In fact, has no past medical history at all and isn't, wasn't taking any medication prior to presentation. No real cardiovascular disease risk factors with clear clinical symptoms of a stroke, right hemiparesis. Sinus rhythm and ECG with a 72-hour ambulatory ECG showing no arrhythmias and very few SVEs and a carotid CT scan showing no dissection. The patient had a transthoracic echo, which is unremarkable except for a moderate bubble shunt right to left and valsalva release, and a typical PFO with an atrial septal aneurysm on transesophageal echo. This is a brain MRI which shows a left frontal lobe infarction in the middle cerebral artery territory. Carmelo, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, it's, it's a, an easy job. It's a very straightforward case for PFO closure. It is a young patient without any adjunctive risk, uh, risk factor, uh, no dyslipidemia, no diabetes, no hypertension with normal uh, uh, echocardiography with a positive bubble test, so with a big uh, shunt uh, and uh, an aneurysmal in the relative septum. Even the imaging, the MRI brain, it's very typical for embolic, uh, um, you know, for embolic stroke. So this is the, the right case, very easy to go. And I would suggest even if you doesn't look, it doesn't decide together with the, your neurologist, this is very easy to understand for everybody. So I will go straight forward to close the PFOs in this kind of patient. Okay, so that's an easy one, Philip. I, I want to make it controversial now. I want to get it interesting here. Same patient, except the symptoms are more short-lived. Actually, they recover within about <coughs> 45 minutes. 
And when the brain MRI is done, there's a delay because he's a bit claustrophobic, can't quite bring himself to have an MRI quite early enough. It's done about two months later, and there's nothing on the brain MRI scan. Are you still going to be closing this PFO? What are your thoughts? Mm. Then we still have patient spe um, specifics, which are typical for a PFO-related stroke. Um, that's, these are ideal. And then the real question is, was it a stroke? So how do you judge the, the clinical event? And I guess that um, as a cardiologist, I would therefore need to consult a radiologist and, and do a very thorough um, um, history of the patient and, and um, yeah, and, and see whether that, whether the, um, that event has been um, considered to be a proper stroke or just a migraine or something else. Okay. Carmelo. Well, in that case, uh, I will call the neurologist. <laughs> so, uh, because you have to be sure that the patient has a TIA or real TIA or real, a real uh, stroke in the, in the past. So, in this case, if the neurologist tell, okay, this is a typical TIA, without any, uh, you know, any evidence, even at the MRI, I will go to close the, 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 the PFO. Otherwise, I will stop and you can follow up the, the patient, you know, that the embolization is not so frequent, so you can even wait on several the patient and maybe you can do the, another MRI after a couple of years. So I think there's two really important points coming out here. First of all, we are not cardiologists, we, we are all cardiologists in the room, we are not the right cohort of people to be making judgments about brain scans or about neurological symptoms. That's neurology and stroke physicians. So we need help from people. And we're moving towards the importance of a multidisciplinary team decision making here. I think the second thing, Carmelo, the point you've brought out, which is really important, is that the natural history of PFO-related stroke is a low recurrent event rate, even if you don't close the PFO. So you can afford to reflect on it and you can afford to talk to the patient and there isn't a rush to close the PFO. Within the randomized controlled trials criteria, there was a clear lower risk with PFO closure, but the event rate in the control arm was also not that high. So I think yeah. that's really key and important. And this just leads very nicely onto this slide, which I hope you can see <coughs> on the web, that shows the kind of grouping that you perhaps want to set up when you're looking to set up a program this is a very important part, a key decision making. We have cardiac implanters, imagers, crucially neurologists and stroke physicians. And sometimes you might want to involve hematologists as well to talk about those patients who may have thrombophilias. What are your views about thrombophilia testing, Philip? We used to do it more often, um, but then we ended up with, uh, <laughs> with um, the problem of not having a clear-cut decision and not knowing exactly what to do. Um, again, if we go back to that um, position statement paper, again, the role has been um, tu um, tuned down a little bit. Um, when we really have a strong suspicion that um, there's a problem, we, we involve them. Um, and it should be said that there's quite often they recommend this despite maybe the indication for uh, oral anticoagulation, there might be still a role for PFO closure in, in, in selected patients. But this is a patient's um, individualized um, decision. Okay. Um, we have a few um, webinar questions coming in, so let's try and address some of those chaps if we can. The first question is PFO closure and diabetic patients with embolic stroke. Well, it is a powerful risk factor for stroke, so I guess it would be one thing that would make you think carefully about it. But I don't think if it was in isolation, everything was against it, and it was a very young patient, I'm not sure I'd necessarily absolutely exclude them. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I think the same of you. Uh, the diabetes, it's a very high risk factor for embolic stroke yeah. and for, for stroke itself. Uh, by the way, if you are in doubt, you can even think to, to close the PFL at least you are lowering the probability to have another stroke. I would say you cannot be sure if, it, if there is a paradoxical embolism, otherwise you have to be there with the, with the camera to see the thrombus coming sure, through sure. to the PFO. So it's not so easy to understand if it is a really embolic uh, uh, patient or not. Uh, so case by case in, the, in this particular uh, kind of patient, you have to decide together again with the multidisciplinary right. team. It's if it's a 21-year-old diet patient, sure, but if it's a 55-year-old, you might think very carefully about it. Yeah. yeah. Next question we have, what is the percentage of atrial arrhythmia post-PFO closure? 
So the randomized control trials show an, uh, an AF rate uh, in the sort of low single figures, 4 or 5%. This is a really fascinating thing. I want to ask you, Philip, do you think this is because uh, people didn't look hard enough for AF beforehand, or do you think there's a direct irritation to the heart causing temporary AF afterwards? Yeah, and then the third explanation would be that it, it was there before, and then um, due to the material in the heart, it, it's easier to, to be detectable because sure. it happens more often. Um, we don't know at this point in time. No, but the, the conclusion is that you have to, you have to include it in your consenting process. Yeah, um, I Very think important. that is important. Um, you have to look for it in, um, in case there are symptoms which um, very much fit you to AFib. And um, if it's uh, diagnosed, then you have to put the patient on, on oral anticoagulation. OK. Well, I think that's a very, very clear message. So if I just wrap up that section, I think we all agree that a multidisciplinary team approach is really crucial to getting the right patient as well as the right PFO for closure. And that if you're considering starting a PFO closure uh, program, the first thing I would suggest you do is engage with those stakeholders, engage with your stroke physicians, engage with neurologists, explain your ideas and the fact that you feel that you can do some benefit to these patients and set up an MDT and, and run it in a rigorous fashion like that. And I think that's a robust way in, in, in order to set up a program. I think what we'll do now is we'll move on to the procedure itself. I, I'd like to lay something out at the start here because I think this is really crucial, particularly for anyone who's setting uh, or thinking about setting up a PFO closure program. There is a very clear but small benefit according to the randomized controlled trials for PFO closure. And therefore, it's clear that in any procedure you do, you want to avoid complications. But really, in more procedures than, than any other, PFO closure must be undertaken as a complication-free procedure. How do you achieve that? Well, my recommendation is you must really be using ultrasound access for the groin. You must use procedural echo. There must be careful attention to anticoagulation, air embolism, and vascular closure. And why do I say all those things? Well, it's, it's not about feasibility. Could you do it without those? Well, of course you can do it without those things. But really, your end product must be a complication-free procedure. I think that's very important in order for your patients to get the benefit of the procedure. Because if you have one complication, that will wipe out the benefit. So that's, that's my view. I don't know what my colleagues in the, in the studio think. Any comments? But okay, I totally agree. Okay. Uh, once again, we are going to treat, we are not going to treat any pathologies. We are trying right. to prevent future events. So the procedure must be complication free. And with the physio who say it, it's easy to, to not have uh, complication. Yeah, I mean, if you want to put a number to, number needed to treat is at least um, 27. So. Considering that the procedure has to be, as you said, complication free. Squeaky clean, as we say in Britain. Exactly. OK, so uh, we've talked about the things that might help you do that. Philip, could you just tell us a little bit about uh, the, the, the echo guidance and, and what, it is, what are you looking for in the echo guidance that helps you make it procedure uh, complication free? Yeah, again, of course you can do it without echo. It is feasible, but if you want to have it complication free, I believe you, you, you have to use echo either TOE or ICE. Um, and the reason for that is it, is give, it, it gives you the, the total picture of the anatomy. It allows you to ensure that, you, um, that the wire went across the, the right hole in the right position. It gives you an indication about the size of the PFO, the, the, the motion of the septum. It allows you to recognize whether your wire may be entangled into some other structures like a reticulari. And, and even if you had a, a very good pre-procedural um, TOE, anatomy might be completely different once you're with the wire across. I think that's very important. The PFO opens up, and um, this is the time to charge the size, not before. OK, I think that's a really important thing. And Camelo, I know you use quite a lot of eyes. Can you, can you care and compare and contrast it with TOE? What do you think are the benefits of ice? What are the downsides of ice? Ice is intracardiac echo. Yeah. As you can see in the, in the slide, we have two different modalities of guiding the procedure with the echo. We had the classical transesophageal echo and we had the intracardiac echo. Of course, with the transesophageal uh, comes from the, the, the esophagus and in, instead the eyes comes with the image uh, from within the, uh, the heart. Uh, the eyes, it's much more easy to stop 
you don't need anesthesiologists, you don't need uh, echocardiography, you will do it by yourself, uh, like uh, the angioplasty, I would say, so you don't need any, any figure. But, uh, uh, of course, you can use even toe with general anesthesia, more often with conscious sedation. And uh, with the TOE, you will have much more better image. Of course, you will have a comprehensive cardiac imaging. You can see even left atrial appendage, uh, valve, uh, right or left ventricle. You can check even for uh, uh, pericardia, any pericardial effusion, I see. So uh, it's uh, much more safer. Uh, but even with the, uh, with the ice, you can do a very safe, uh, very safe procedure. And of course, uh, uh, the TOE is uh, much, uh, uh, much cheaper because you can use it multiple times. Uh, the ice, it's uh, uh, usually one, uh, one, uh, one single, it, it is product for one single use in many, in many of country. Okay. There's a webinar question just come in and I'm going to put it to you, Philip, because it's a tricky one. Well, part of it's tricky. So uh, we've done a PFO closure and we find AF afterwards. What are you going to do with your antithrombotics? What do and you I do? assume that's a scenario where, um, where it's not periprocedural AF, but AF which, um, which occurred later on. Uh, no, I, I mean, well, it's not clear from the question, but let's say it was fine within uh, uh, three weeks of the procedure being done. Well, then I would put the patient on, on um, oral anticoagulation. And I think that is not controversial. The second part of the question is, should it be lifelong? Tricky one, <laughs> as you yeah. said, absolutely. Um, again, it depends. Well, um, well, um, when it's a patient who had a high risk for AFib anyway, even before, then it's very unlikely that it will go away. I mean, um, many say that AFib never goes away. Um, the real question is whether it, it might be due to some interaction between the device and the heart and whether this could get better with endothelialization, then you could argue that maybe it goes away. Um, I would consider that in very young patients with a very low risk, other than that lifelong anti oral anticoagulation. Camelo? Well, we have to say, first of all, that the majority of uh, AFib that comes uh, with, the, with the intervention after the procedure uh, usually resolve by itself. So it is a small percentage that uh, go, uh, go for, a lifelong, uh, for a lifelong treatment. And for sure, if you have an antifibrillation, you have to go with the oral anticoagulation. Then you can think, it is not uh, the argument of this uh, webinar, but then you can think, of course, to uh, ablation of uh, AFib. You can even think if the uh, AFib doesn't, uh, doesn't interrupt, you can even think to close LAA uh, appendage to, to interrupt the oral anticoagulation. It is not uh, the argument of this uh, PCR webinar, but... Uh, I, I, I mean, the reason we're having a debate about it is because there is not a correct answer. I, 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 and I'm going to give you my view, and I would tend to agree with Philip. I think that the, the default has to be lifelong anticoagulation, yeah. unless you have factors that really mitigate against that. Um, we do quite a lot of implantable loop recorders, and I suppose if you have had it in for six months before and there's been absolutely nothing at all, and then suddenly it comes around the procedure and you record for another two years because the life is usually around three years and you still have nothing in a very low risk patient, you might just about think about not a lifelong anticoagulation. But I think that the default is probably going to have to be long term because, you know, the trial data is there for it, isn't it? So, Carmelo. Would you take us through the procedure a bit further? Let's talk about crossing the PFO, the techniques you use for that. Uh, yes, how I already told you, the PFO intervention is probably the, the easiest uh, intervention that we can do. And uh, it's easy to cross the PFO, a large PFO. You can advance uh, uh, to, uh, through the, the uh, multiple post catheter. You can advance uh, a standard O35 uh, wire. Uh, with a, a J, a J, J tapered wire, and you go through the PFO. Once you uh, go uh, through the PFO, you put your wire into the left upper pulmonary vein uh, to have a straight rail to go uh, then with your uh, uh, with your device. In case of uh, uh, tunnel or very uh, small PFO, you can even use uh, um, hydrophilic wire or uh, a straight tip adjustable wire. Uh, for instance, it is the one that we use to, to cross the uh, stenotic aortic valve to implant the TAVI. Uh, and then once you have your super, you can exchange your wire with the super stiff wire and you can move on 
uh, with, uh, uh, with the device. And uh, at the echo, you can uh, nicely see on the left upper panel, uh, there is the PFO. This is a short axis view of uh, TOA with the aorta on the, um, the aortic valve. On the left of the, of the aortic valve, we have the aortic rim and the septum that it's closing, it is uh, uh, laying on the uh, aortic rim. Uh, and on the right panel, you see the Y through the PFO that is opening the PFO. Already with the wire inside the PFO, you can have uh, a sort of, uh, I would say, you can imagine how, uh, which device you can implant. And uh, uh, sometimes you see that with the wire, you widely open the PFO, and then you have to think what, uh, uh, what wire to put. So this is a really important point you're making here, Carmelo. I think we can see on the slides on the right-hand side both right-hand slides, how much uh, deviation of the premium septum is yeah. being caused by just a wire going across. Wire. So I think, and we have a question on this, how do you exactly uh, device size? I mean, th this is information you need to tune into that, is that right? Do you want to expand a little bit on sizing, Carmelo? Uh, yes. Uh, I used to, to, to take measure of uh, the whole septum to understand which is the maximum size yeah. that I can put yep. in. And I used to, to measure the aortic rim. I start from the aorta towards the, uh, the wire to understand which is the measure. And you, can, uh, uh, you have to double this measure that you found, and uh, you will find the, 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 the correct sides of, uh, of the device. If you have a small aortic rim, uh, maybe you can use, for example, a, a softer device, uh, the Gorea. Uh, the G GSO, the Goreceptor occluder is very soft and it can embrace all the, the, aortic, uh, the aortic rim without any, any injury. Uh, so even the experience will, uh, will help you to, to choose the right, uh, the right Philip, device. Uh, tell me about balloon sizing. Is it useful? Uh, when, when do you use it? Normally we start with a, with a um, septal interrogation. So it's not yes. really a sizing, it's more of yes. an interrogation and we use there for um, swan Gans catheter. Yeah. Okay. So if that... Um, if that doesn't cross, then um, I would not do any more sizing. Um, I then normally use a 25 millimeter device yeah. um, if it fits in nicely. Um, when I have a, a large aneurysm, then sometimes I use bigger devices um, when the anatomy allows it to, to, to cover more of the, of the aneurysm. When the, when the, um, the swan guns, when that crosses very easily, then I would use a, um, a proper um, balloon to do sizing yes. um, and then the magical number for me is then 15, 16, 17 millimeters when it's above that then I would even consider using an ASD device. Other than that I, I use a, a large PFO device. So, so if I may summarize, if the, uh, if the tunnel opens up wide or it's a particularly long tunnel, we would gravitate towards the larger device sizes. Actually, for a number of the manufacturers, there are not that many sizes to choose from. You gravitate towards those larger ones. Uh, balloon sizing can be helpful, uh, although many people find it not necessary, and I don't personally use it particularly often. Um, and then you can get a very precise measurement when you use a balloon. And the conventional, or at least one of the common methods, is using the very compliant long balloons that are inflated, again, not to stretch, but just to get stop flow. Um, and they can be helpful. They can provide information. Um, OK, let's talk a little about the devices then. There are a lot of devices that have been approved for PFO closure. Um, the truth is, uh, most of them have a sort of double umbrella style of uh, closure. Most of them have a push-pull style mechanism of deployment, and they're all pretty effective. That's really the bottom line. We've got a range of them, you can see in the graphic here. Um, we've got a, an Oclitec device. We've got, um, we've got the Gore Cardioform. We've got Seraflex. We've got the Abbott PFO occluder and the Ultraset. But there are other devices. There are also stitch-based devices, such as Noble Stitch. And they all have their pros and cons. And really, there isn't the time to go through those here today. But they do have a fairly similar mechanism of deployment and use. We're going to take you through just one of them today in the interest of time. This is a Gore Cardioform device. This is a device which has a helical uh, nitinol uh, frame on, on top of it. It's got uh, a Gore-Tex fabric. And, and, and most of the occluders have a similar style with a left atrial and right atrial disc. You can see on the graphics that there is a pusher handle 
uh, which is attached to a catheter and a pre-mounted device. And you deploy the device, as you can see. Uh, first, first of all, of course, you draw it back into the catheter, having flushed it. And you can see that happening on these graphics here with the discs disappearing into the catheter. This is an example of the, uh, of the same graphic happening live. You can see it's been done underwater. And the right atrial disc is captured followed by the left atrial disc. You can see the framework going in. It is captured right into the delivery catheter, uh, and then it's very thoroughly flushed. And that's, a, that's very common to all of these devices. De-airing in particular attention to that is important. This particular device has a short monorail. It's mounted over the wire that's already been placed neatly into the left upper pulmonary vein. You can see it being mounted here, and then you can see the delivery sheath being passed up into the, certainly close to the mouth of the left upper vein. You can see it happening here uh, on this graphic. Do you have any particular tips or do you want to talk us through the deployment now that we're in the left atrial disc, Carmelo? Yes, once uh, you are in the uh, left tatum, uh, you can see that this device has three markers, three different markers that helps you to deliver the, uh, the device. At the beginning of uh, this angio that we loop right now, you will have the first marker is on the distal tip, and then we advance with the, uh, with the knob on, on the delivery system, and you show that uh, the second marker is going toward the first one, the distal one. This means that we have the left side uh, disc opened. Once the disc is completely opened on the left side, you pull all the system to get in touch with the left uh, part of the atrial uh, of the atrial uh, septum, and then when you got uh, uh, when you keep in tension all the all the system, and then advance again with the with a knob on uh, on the smart handle uh, to open the right side disc. Uh, making this, you have left disc on the left side, right disc on the right side, and it will keep the PFO closed. Um, this is the appearance on the echo. You can see on the app, it is the, the uh, left atrium with, uh, uh, with the left uh, disc open it, and uh, it is touching a laying on the, uh, on the atrial septum. And uh, uh, after that, if everything is okay, if the, all the discs are opposite, you have no big chance, you have no any, any uh, you know, any imaging that uh, uh, tells you that there is something wrong, you can unlock in the device. That means that it is almost released and uh, left in place. And then this particular device has a sort of uh, security, uh, security thread that you can remove completely and uh, helps you to retrieve the device in case of uh, any, any complication. If everything is okay, you can release totally the device by removing the security thread and finish the, the procedure. And this is the, the final uh, result, the final image. Uh, on the left, uh, on the upper left, you see the angiography appearance of both, uh, uh, of both the, the, the disc. And you see that the three markers are really near. That means the device is uh, uh, correctly located and correctly deployed. On the right upper panel, you have a 3D reconstruction. You really nicely see uh, at the disc and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the septum. And then you have the, um, the 2D image uh, without a video color that's, uh, in which we are seeing that uh, there is no, no shunt. It is astonishing, and you can see in that image how delicate these devices are. I mean, that's great for the patient. They conform well, they're delicate. Actually, Really quite hard to see it on, uh, on, the, on the 2D. You can see it very clear in the 3, but quite yeah. hard to see. Yeah. So um, I just want to present some tips and tricks as to be sure you're doing the patient some benefit here. And I know it's a little bit silly to say, but please ensure that the procedure is indicated. Uh, take the opportunity to emphasize again the importance of an MDT approach. Uh, it's my recommendation use ultrasound for venous access. I think it's in, in a long-term program and for after over many decades that probably is the best way of avoiding um, complications. Personally, I like to give heparin straight away. I believe clots start to form from the very uh, time you puncture the vessel and therefore you must puncture sh from the start. De-air, de-air and de-air again. It's very important. 
And some of the, um, many of the devices have very well worked up delivery sheaths with valves on the end. And, and in many regards, it's a bit easier to keep the air out. Some of them don't, though, and uh, some centres, including our own, when they're using particular uh, open-ended delivery catheters, pull the dilator out while the dilator is submerged in a shallow bowl of water because it's unusual, but occasionally, as you pull your delivery sheath out, air can suck in. It's unusual, but it's another safety mechanism to stop any particular air uh, problems. We haven't talked that much today about the anatomy of the PFO, and it is true, most of the time it's fairly straightforward. But occasionally you can have an adverse anatomy and it doesn't mean you can't close them with a PFO occluder, but you do need to know up front so that you can choose the appropriate occluder and so that we can uh, be prepared for those. And that again is the importance of echo guidance so that you know you've got a good result at the end. We have a question from the webinar here uh, and they're asking us, uh, you've done your closure and uh, you then see some bubbles later on let's say they haven't specified the time, but if you've done a bubble study at three months, you see some bubbles. What, what are you going to do, Philip, if you see bubbles at a three-month study? Well, I wouldn't see bubbles during the procedure, and I also wouldn't see them at three months, because normally we, we check at six months. Yeah. Um, at that time, about 90% um, of patients should not have any residual shunting anymore with uh, presumably good endothelialization, then it's, it's all good. At three months, I wouldn't be worried too much. I, um, I would postpone the um, assessment for six months. Um, if I see then a lot of bubbles at six months, then I would um, continue having the patients on a dual antiplatelet therapy. We will come to that a bit later on the post-procedural management. Um, and then when, it's, when there's still significant shunting at one year, then I would at least consider whether um, that patient needs an additional procedure, but that very much depends then on the size and then the anatomy and on, on the problem, is, is, is the device not properly in place or what's the reason for the residual shunting? So I'll give my view on this, Camelo, excuse me for not coming to you, we're running close, close yeah. on time. Um, we used, so uh, totally agree, three months, there's no point in doing it then because you expect further endothelializations Actually, often we don't do it at six months because I still think that might be too early because if you see it at six months, you're probably just going to repeat it again. Although I hear what you say, you continue your dual antiplatelets. My view is that the important thing, and in the past, uh, we used to spend a lot of time making sure we got complete closure and we would do second procedures. My view is the important thing is that you've correctly deployed your device and that you've stopped the PFO tunnel from opening widely. If you've done that, and at a year you see some small bubbles going through, I don't believe that represents a significant stroke risk. I don't have evidence to support that, but that is my view. And I would wonder whether or not it's in the patient's interest to have a second procedure, provided the device is in properly and provided that it, the PFO tunnel is not flipping open. That's my own personal view. Um, so, Philip. Tell us a bit about the post, we've talked a little bit about antithrombotics. Could you just tell us a bit about it? Yeah, obviously there are a lot of differences um, from institution to institution and, and from country to country. Um, I guess it's, it's, it's very wise to do a pre-discharge echo just to make sure that everything is fine, the device is in place, there's no thrombus on it. Um, according to the trials which were made, um, you should put the patients on dual antiplatelet therapy probably for six months and then can stop afterwards and continue with a mono um, platelet therapy, a aspirin or clopidogrel. Um, this is why I like to do the echo at six months, because if you so see no shunting anymore, it feels better to, to, to stop and switch to monotherapy. And um, you should certainly consider um, um, antibiotic prophylaxis up to six months and again can stop that when you see nice endothelialization at six months indicated by no shunting anymore. And, um, and then also an echo in between just to detect um, early problems which might be device migration or thrombosis. Very rare, but um, certainly good if you detect them early. We have another webinar question, Carmelo. For PFO closure procedure, is mandatory cardiovascular surgery backup no, necessary. No, I think it is the only structural intervention which we don't need uh, a surgical backup uh, because it's easy to go through and if you, if you do all the things in the right way, you will not have complication. So it is not mandatory to have surgery.
Philip? I agree. You, you should know how to deal with a tamponade, but um, otherwise, uh, other than that, I agree. Yeah. But what you've both emphasised is the importance of attention to detail when you go through or respect all the ste steps. Absolutely. In the eco guidance, but yeah. the eco guidance is really, really, really important. Yeah. With the eco, you see everything, and it's almost impossible to have a complication. Absolutely. You didn't talk about infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Do you use it at all? Guidelines have been changing and evolving over the last 10 years. What do you do? Uh, what do you advise your patients post procedure regarding infective endocarditis antibiotic prophylaxis? Now, I mentioned it briefly for six months. Um, if you have no residual shunting anymore um, at six months, then you can stop it. If, if you still have shunting, then the assumption is that, that there is no proper endothelialization, and then you should consider to continue that. Perfect. Very clear answer. So I'd like to wrap things up now. We're drawing to the end of the webinar. Thank you both very much for your input. I think the key messages I'd really like to draw out here is, and I think we have emphasized these, careful patient selection is key to procedural success. And this is really best done in an MDT setting with shared decision making, shared examination of the data with stroke physician or neurologist, an imager and an interventional cardiologist. And I think I've said this on a number of occasions, you must respect the steps of the procedure. There must be uh, very exquisite uh, attention to detail without compromise. We're really aiming for a complication-free procedure in order to do the best for a patient. Any final words from my colleagues in the studio? No, you were very, very comprehensive. So I think that these key messages are really important. And that's, that's all. Yeah, I mean, select your patients well and avoid complications. Brilliant. That's a lovely summary. We've now reached the end of this webinar on PFO closure in 2019, how, who and why. We hope you find it useful. On behalf of my colleagues here at the PCR studios, uh, we'd like to thank PCR and Gore for the support, uh, supporting this webinar and all the best to you all for the future. Take care.